Over thank to you for the introduction. <clears throat> Good morning to everyone. Uh, hello to Dr. Goria, to Selina, to all colleagues. I'm very happy to be part of this e international event, well organized as always. And um, I think we have reached about 200 presentations by now because, <laughs> because also of the so many international involvements in which I am involved and of which I am proud to be part of because uh, as Selina was saying, uh, it is a matter of networking. It is a matter of exchanging experience and uh, it is not only something that we commit for our work. It is something that we do also for promoting best practices in forensic sciences, specifically in the human identification <clears throat> uh, process. To this regard, I am sharing with you uh, this time something uh, novel uh, because it is not strictly related to forensic odontology, but is uh, of course related to forensic sciences and specifically to the process of human identification. Um, I will share with you a presentation that will introduce to you some updates on the computer assisted superimposition of skull and the picture of a missing person. Let me start by um, sharing my PowerPoint. Um, yes, it is here. Um, I think you can see this. It is, uh, we have to move this, okay. Just give me, please, uh, Ranji, the feedback. Yes, sir. It's coming fine, sir. Okay. And uh, mm, this presentation is the, um, let's say, the consequence, let's say, of a, a scientific collaboration that we have uh, recently started with uh, a cooperative research called Panacea in Spain. And uh, I would like to, first of all, uh, highlight the fact that uh, I would like to disclose that there is no commercial interest in the material I will present because the presentation involves also a software uh, of which I have no commercial interest, but only the scientific interest in evaluating this software for the purpose of enhancing superimposition. In this regard, I would like also to highlight that this presentation is using uh, the most of the material that I've been shared, the, the, they, these colleagues have shared with me, in particular, Rosario Guerra, who is a forensic anthropologist, and also Oscar Ibanez, who is an expert in a PhD in computer science and is one of the founders of this Panacea um, cooperative research. And uh, I would like to thank both and also the other staff of Panacea because we are working in uh, uh, evaluating this software of which I will present by the, at the end of this presentation, which is a software that brings new light, new insight in the process of superimposition between an unidentified skull and a person who is missing. Now, uh, the, the, let's in, let us introduce the, the principle of craniofacial superimposition. It is a, a very well-known forensic technique. I'm sure that all of you have studied it in uh, the education in forensic sciences. Uh, it is very old. It is very old. And somehow it seemed to be abandoned until 2015, where there was uh, a, new, uh, a new trend with uh, the opportunity of giving to this technique a new uh, technical involvement using artificial intelligence. So as simply as it is, it is a comparison between uh, a picture of a missing person of missing persons, of course, more than one, with a found unidentified skull. Um, the photograph of the skull is projected, let's say, on top of the picture of the 2D picture of the missing person. When you have like a, a skull face overlay, 
And of course, there is a forensic expert who tries to attempt and establish if this skull may belong to the person who is missing or not. Uh, the, the goal, of course, of the superimposition between the, the picture of the skull and the face of the person, of the portrait picture of the person, is, of course, to evaluate uh, potential anatomical consistency. This means that you can use this technique, as we all know in forensic, not only to find compatible persons, but also to exclude people who are not compatible with the anatomical features that we reveal from the skull. Now, the hypothesis of this technique is also that the skull is unique, just like fingerprints, and that there is also a direct relationship between the anatomy, the skull itself, and the morphology of the soft tissue and of the face. Because of course, we are comparing, as you, as you know, as you can imagine, the landmarks, specific landmarks on, of the skull with the, land, the equivalent landmarks, but on the soft tissue of the face of the person who is missing. So the comparison and superimposition is, uh, between an unknown skull, let's say, which is uh, obtained either by doing a 3D scanner or because you are using a TC scan and you have a 3D image of the skull which has been found. And also with the 2D portrait picture of the person who is missing in order to establish, but as I said, also to exclude the identity. Uh, the superimposition and the comparison tries to uh, depict uh, morphological correspondences in order to determine if uh, the skull belongs to the person who is missing. Uh, now, from the point of view of uh, looking for portrait pictures, nowadays we are uh, extremely helped by the so many availability of portrait pictures, of selfie pictures of people. So when we start considering which portrait picture should I use, uh, if we compare this with the past, nowadays we have such an amount of uh, portrait pictures showing the face of a person. So from this point of view, it is very easy nowadays to ask the family of the missing persons to share with us a portrait pictures, which as I will show you, should be not only a front picture, but also a picture showing other sides, lateral sides of the face. On the other hand, we can use uh, the, uh, we have to scan, of course, the skull, the skull who is not identified. And nowadays we can easily use uh, the TC scan from one side, or uh, we can use uh, the uh, scanner, the portable scanner, like this one that uh, we have recently um, purchased at the, the Human Identification Laboratory in Turin, where we can do very a very quick and fast and precise scanning of the skull, which will be used for the superimposition. Or, as we all know, as doctors, we can also simply use the, the CBCT segmentation of a TC scan and obtain a 3D image of this TC. In both cases, you have an, a 3D image of the skull, which will be used to, let's say, identify certain specific morphological and anatomical landmarks, which will be used in order to uh, allow the comparison with the skull and the picture of the person who is missing. Uh, from the historical point of view, uh, the superimposition between uh, the picture of the skull and the picture of a person is uh, already known about more than, one, more than 100 years. The first superimposition is uh, dated 1885, 
while the first uh, positive identification using this technique in a court is dated 1962. And also we have some uh, positive identification also of, uh, uh, let's say, historical persons like uh, even the terrible, like Mozart. Uh, we also have uh, positive identification cases in some DVI situations, like in Turkey, Serbia, uh, in the tsunami 2004, and also in some terroristic identification in 2009. Now, the reason why it is important for us as experts to refer to historical uh, cases is that uh, independently from uh, the way you want to trust or not this technique, it has been proven to be uh, to be to be valid to achieve a positive identification and this is the reason why even if there are uh, so many controversy on this specific technique it still can give a positive output and for this reason as an extra resource in the field of human identification we cannot ignore the use of this technique, especially with what I will share with you, which, re which regards the use of a software, which is enhancing the superimposition and comparison technique using artificial intelligence. And this is what actually happened in 2015, where uh, there was a group uh, of several experts from uh, several countries, including John Clement from Australia, uh, and I would like to remind him as one of my mentors, uh, this project supported by the European Union called New Methodology and Protocols of Forensic Identification by Craniofacial Superimposition, MEPROX, led to uh, the goal of creating a consensus, a consensus on several aspects which are related to this technique in order to reduce the error and in order to uh, have an international understanding on what is the basis that we should apply, what should be the standard, so that we don't have differences in experts employing this technique differently depending on their country of origin. To this regard, there, are, there were the differences in the approach that every expert was applying in every country because there were differences in the landmarks that we, they were using, in the tools they were using for the superimposition and in the final criteria that uh, experts were uh, uh, applying in order to achieve a decision. For example, to give you an example, how many features should be uh, confirmed in order to establish or exclude an identity, just like for fingerprintings. How many, how many uh, uh, details, how many, uh, how many correspondence, how many matches should I find in order to achieve a positive ID? And this is something that was achieved through this uh, international uh, um, meetings and project, which involved so many experts from different countries, uh, which uh, started to put down, to write down what are the best practices in craniofacial superimpositions? What are the, let's say, the principles, the criteria that should be applied and what should be the process or uh, the mistakes uh, that should not be put in place. This means standardize the position of all landmarks, standardize criteria in order to achieve to an international scale of decision-making universal for all the experts. Uh, now, the main, so the problem with this technique is that there are several sources of errors that you may also imagine yourself, which is 
the adequate perspective, the positioning of the mandible, which is usually art disarticulated uh, in to re in with regards to the skull, the attachment of the mandible to the, to the cranium, the replication of the same position that the person is having during the portrait pictures, which could be a front picture, but could be also a lateral or semi-lateral um, orientation. And also the, the preservation of post-mortem uh, uh, reassembly of the skull, sometimes with incorrect uh, repositioning of teeth within their own alveolus. Among other errors, we have the uh, inaccurate acquisition of a 3D skull. Okay, nowadays, using the scanner that I showed you, of course, for example, this uh, risk, this error is not more in place because we use 3D scanner, which are extremely precise and will not allow us to achieve any mistakes. Also, the other aspect is the ratio of the photographs. Now, also to this regard, today we are uh, supported by the fact that, uh, as you know, when you take a picture with a digital camera, and we are all using digital camera today, we have all the properties of that specific camera. We can obtain information which is saved within uh, the data, within the file of that uh, uh, image. And this allow us to incorporate other information when we use that picture for the purpose of uh, a superimposition. Um, of course, other problems related to skull damage, depending of course on case by cases. Other source are, uh, other controversy with the, this technique is the uh, not errors in themselves, but controversy, uncertainty on the exact location of some landmarks. Um, of course, there are landmarks which can depend, which will depend uh, on the quality of the picture, on the position of the camera while taking the picture of the person who is missing, and also. Uh, some features that are in the face, like glasses or hair, that can sometimes make some uh, uh, make um, some uncertainty on where to place the specific landmass, which will be used for the superimposition. And if, of course, sometimes there is also some imprecise uh, positioning of anthropometric uh, landmarks on the skull for this for this reason. Uh, the set of landmarks, of course, are uh, obtained by studies that have been performed by researchers. So we have on one side the landmarks that you have to apply on the skull and the landmarks which you have to apply on the face. Uh, the other uncertainty about this technique is, of course, the way we have uh, to determine the accuracy between one picture and another picture. And we have to consider that, uh, and that the, this is the reason why there is a data set of landmarks, because, uh, and not just a unique data set, because the positioning of landmarks on the face is, of course, the expression also of uh, ethnical aspects of, and sex and aspects. And for this reason, uh, with the software, I will uh, uh, very briefly show you, you can choose the landmarks that you want to apply in order to apply the correct landmarks and obtain a certainty rather than create uh, mistakes in the positioning. There are some issues related also to the age of the per missing persons because we may have a picture of a child or a young person and of course we have to consider the date of that picture in uh, in comparison with the skull that we are using for the superimposition now for this reason this development this evolution of this technique is uh, uh, inevitably taking advantage, which is a very positive aspect, uh, and this is the reason why I was very attracted by this software developed by Panacea called Skeleton ID, 
Uh, again, I don't have any commercial interest. I am interested in this software because uh, it is a tool that has evolved uh, this process to something that makes it, you know, first of all, smarter because you are using a software and I will show you a very quick video of this. And secondly, it is using uh, artificial intelligence, which uh, helps the experts in the positioning of the landmarks. Usually uh, the software is uh, using 18 landmarks on the skull and the equivalent landmarks on the, on the, on the picture. Uh, the consistency and the morphological contours of the skull and of the soft tissues have been taken into account. So you have to consider that we don't have the time today for this, during this presentation to introduce to you, of course, the entire process of this uh, uh, software tool, of course. Uh, but I can give you a brief uh, uh, introduction to this because we will have on one side the positioning of the landmarks on the 3D picture of the skull obtained by the scanning or by the, uh, the, the DC scan on one side, and we will place the, the landmarks on the 2D pictures of the person. Uh, preferably not only the front picture, but also pictures showing uh, lateral areas of, uh, of the face. So we do, uh, we do this, we place these landmarks uh, and the criteria is to place the landmarks in a very specific way, uh, supported by the software, which helps you in the best positioning of these landmarks. So it's not the computer, it's not the application that does the superimposition. It's not the application that places the landmarks. It will always be the expert, but the expert is assisted by the computer who is also using algorithm coming from artificial intelligence in order to make our life, let's say, easier for the positioning of these landmarks. And the, uh, the artificial intelligence will perform the final superimposition once we have placed the landmarks on the skull on one picture and on the image of the face on the second picture. You can see here uh, the list of the landmarks that are placed on the, this is Oscar, of the picture um, of the face and on the skull. And uh, the criteria is based uh, on the thickness, of course, of the soft tissue, which is obtained by specific uh, uh, scientific uh, articles that have been published where uh, this thickness has been obtained. So the thickness is not a, a data that has been just added without a criteria. It comes out from the literature which has been incorporated in this software. And this is the reason why you can choose the landmarks that in, a data, in the data sets that are incorporated in the, the software. So imagine we are super, we are comparing two pictures, a 2D pictures, and you can see, you can see in transparency the skull behind with the landmarks that you can see. The pink landmarks are from the picture of the person from the portrait pictures. The yellow green pictures of land dots are from the skull. Uh, so the software itself, so the software itself it appears with like this, you have uh, several tools which allows you to move, uh, to turn, to orient the skull so that you can place the skull in the same position of the head when the picture was taken. This is the reason why it makes it uh, easier for us because you are using a software that allows the movement, as you will see, the rotation of the 3D image of the skull so that you can position the skull 
for example, in the same pose of the person while he was taking the portrait picture. And to give you a taste of this software, uh, these are the landmarks. Again, you can see the, the different landmarks that are positioned to the skull because you are able to rotate and move the skull, zoom in, zoom out, etc. And uh, by using the arrow of the mouse, you can click and open and choose the specific landmarks that you are using to, and you want to place. To give you a taste, I was saying, I, will give, I have done a very, uh, let's say, editing of, uh, a bit of a video, which is about four minutes, where you can see the interface of the of this software. Now you can see we have the 2D picture of the person is missing. So we start placing the landmarks. And on the other side, on the other, on the other window, we have the unidentified. So we choose, for example, the landmark set in the in the data sets that are available and that they've been incorporated using the literature, as you can see here. And then, and then you import this data set. And as you can see, you start placing the landmarks like this by zooming, by rotating the skull. And these arrows are actually the positioning of the soft tissue. So you have the landmark on the bone of the skull, but then you have the arrow, which is, uh, an, which is, is the consequence, not only of the thickness of the soft tissue, considering the ethnic and the sex and the age, but it also gives you the idea of the orientation that will allow us at the end of this process to superimpose the skull and the 2D picture like you are seeing here. And uh, as you've seen in the previous uh, uh, picture, you are actually able to place the Frankfurt plane. You are able to rotate the skull to zoom in, etc. And in this way, it is uh, easier for the forensic expert to perform whatever is the superimposition we want to achieve in order to get straight away a consistency with the, the compatibility or the exclusion of the skull. And uh, there are other features typical of a photo editing software, like uh, you can uh, do some transparency, you can uh, superimpose the picture and then reduce or increase the transparency so that you are observing because it's the expert who is observing and uh, performing the superimposition. And uh, let me go here. As you can see here, we can uh, reduce or uh, uh, increase the opacity and other aspects related to this. Okay, this is the, one of the simplest tools. And uh, once we do the, uh, once we ask uh, to do the superimposition using the landmarks, uh, it will actually allow us to place the skull. Uh, considering the same size uh, of the image. And in, this, in that situation, we will able to obtain a very important information. We will get the information, first of all, if we can include or exclude that skull from the identity, and we will obtain also the compatibility and positive identification in some cases using this technique. Uh, I'm going to the end of my presentation. And of course, you have to consider that what I am sharing with you has to be considered a recommendation. I'm not saying that you have to use this software. I'm just sharing with you an important update using new technologies in the field of this specific process of 
achieving an identification using craniofascial superimposition. Maybe you, uh, maybe you don't trust this uh, technique. Maybe you don't believe in this technique. Nevertheless, as a forensic expert, you should be aware that this technique is also using uh, relevant and recent software using artificial intelligence, which have, uh, uh, let's say, incre increased the accuracy of this technique. Uh, the circumstances of this specific technique are to be considered an extra resource in the human identification. Uh, we, you have been hearing presentation the, uh, presenting the primary identifiers. They will remain the gold standards. DNA, fingerprints, and dental data will remain, of course, the primary identifiers within any field, any, uh, any cases of human identification. This technique could be interesting, could be valid in those cases where you have tried all the other tools and you still have uh, human remains without an identity. And of course, depending on each case, this technique could be considered and could be applied. But the expert will have to evaluate this criteria, considering every time, every case as a different case. Uh, in the best practices, uh, important using this technique is, first of all, is to use a real skull. A real skull that should be scanned, of course. It is important to have as much as possible pictures of the person who is missing, specifically not only of good quality, but also in different poses. Of course, try to get try to, to avoid any pictures where we have spectacles, glasses, birds, and try to use the most recent uh, pictures of the people who are missing in order to, uh, to, have no, to, have not, to not have any concerns related to the age, uh, depending on the age of the missing person, comparing with the time of the recovery of the, the human remains. Uh, use, of course, original AM photos and try to preserve the ratio of the photograph. When we use uh, digital information and now pictures are all digital, we can get uh, information within the data of uh, recorded, saved with the file, because we have the model, the focal length, the time, all this information in, is usually inside the, the digital picture. Uh, another important aspect, uh, and this is the reason why landmarks are placed into different moments, is to analyze the skull, first of all, and then analyze uh, the uh, face of the missing persons separately, in order not to be biased by this process. And try to, uh, to prioritize the sequence, which is... Uh, start with the picture of the person who is the least to be compatible and then go to the person to the pictures that you feel is most probably the most compatible with the the, the, the skull um, try to uh, to use as much as possible landmarks and also consider that there is a very important discriminative power in this technique which is the exclusion criteria and the landmarks that will be let's say matched should be weighted depending on the area of the anatomic uh, area that we are uh, considering now to give you a final important uh, detail about this process is that uh, it is uh, mm, presumed that uh, in order to achieve uh, uh, and let's say a compatibility between the skull and the picture, the landmarks that should be uh, satisfied are at least over 13. So you cannot achieve a positive identification just because you have a, a match of six, seven or 10 uh, anatomical and morphological landmarks. Of course, it, they must be over 13. And the other aspect is try to obtain frontal and oblique or lateral face photographs of the person who are missing. Because when we have the skull, 
of course, we are in the position to rotate the skull and obtain also important landmarks on the lateral aspects of the skull. With this said, I would like to thank you uh, from, for your attention and send you also the greetings of, of course, the Università di Torino, my university, where I have the privilege to be one of the academic staff.